kissed by sunlight's golden hue, a fluttering marvel, a spectacle to view. Papilio Mahal, O regal butterfly, with wings of vibrant yellow soaring high. In open landscapes where white flowers bloom, you dance with grace, dispelling any gloom. A symphony of colors, a sight to behold. Your elegance and beauty, a tale untold. O oh, majestic swallowtail, so grand and bright, you grace the world with sheer delight. Your wings, a canvas of artistic design, adorned with patterns, intricate and fine. So let us celebrate the swallowtail's flight, a symbol of nature's beauty, shining so bright. In the tapestry of life, they leave an everlasting mark. Video Maha, a vision to embark. In today's video, we're going to take a look at the world's most iconic swallowtail butterfly. Oh my god! Wow! What are these, ladies and gentlemen? This is Papilio Mahaon, also known as the Old World Swallowtail. This beautiful and iconic butterfly is found in parts of North America, Europe and Asia. As you can see, it's very widespread. And because of how widespread it is, it is one of the most iconic and classic species of butterflies representative of the swallowtail family. And today I'm going to show you how you can raise these magnificent animals in captivity because they are actually easy to breed. With a little bit of care and compassion, you can study these animals yourself. This is Bart Coppens and you're watching Butterfly Cycles. Butterfly Cycles is my online web series where we raise butterflies together from egg to fully grown butterfly. And today I'm going to show you a breeding tutorial of how to breed the old world swallowtail Papilio Maho. Let's start the intro. Wonk. Lighting. I need to get like studio. Anyway, somebody just sent me the eggs of a butterfly. 
They are the eggs of the old world swallowtail, Papilio Machal. And I'll quickly show you what they look like. Has mailed them to me in coin cases. Coin cases are very good for sending butterfly eggs. And if we zoom in, now the green things here are plant clippings. Yeah, they are literally the clippings of a plant. I think it's fennel or dill. Could be fennel. Because uh, if these butterflies lay eggs, it's hard to remove the eggs from the plant. So they just people just cut off the leaves, even including the eggs, and sent them to me by mail. Now these round yellow and brown things are the eggs of the old world swallowtail, Papilio Mahon. I think we have about... how many do we have? It's not too much, I think we have like 20 of them. The yellow eggs are undeveloped, they're probably more freshly laid, while the, the dark brown eggs are developing, so the caterpillars will probably hatch very soon. So we need to keep an eye on this. Butterfly lovers pay attention, this is a classic species, you're going to love it. Many people have asked me to raise this species on YouTube, it's finally going to happen. Hope you're going to enjoy it as much as I am. Hope we succeed. It's a really beautiful butterfly and the caterpillars are also amazing. Let me show you how to raise them. I have to be quiet. Shh. It's the middle of the night right now at two o'clock, but we have an emergency. Let me show you. Magnifier has lights. Look, isn't that neat? Anyway, the problem is as follows. It's our babies, guys. Our eggs have started to hatch. Do you see those tiny black things, those stripes? Those are babies of the old world swallowtail, Papilio Machaum. And it's an emergency because these babies, they like to eat fast. These are so small that they can starve in a short time. And so I'm going to give them an emergency feeding at night, but please, Please know this is not their permanent home, okay? So this is what I've got. Let's use some illumination here. So this here is fennel. Fennel is one of the plants that the caterpillars really like. They also like other plants including carrot, dill and many others. Milk parsley and just normal parsley, I believe. Anyway. I'll open the box, yeah, I will take this piece of fennel, which is fresh from my garden, I grown it myself, place it in the box, and next I have to be really careful about placing the babies in here. Now guys, this needs to be done really carefully, this is really dangerous, they are very fragile, very small animals, yeah, can you see that? Now this is, I don't recommend rearing them in a plastic container. This is an emergency solution. Tomorrow I'll show you how I'll actually make a proper enclosure for them. Okay, see how insanely small they are though. That's crazy, yeah? Those tiny black things are going to be a huge butterfly. Anyway, they are chewing the old leaf. I don't like that. Uh, it's not good for them. They should be eating the fresh leaf. Gonna use my fingers here, which is not optimal. I should have bought like a tweezer, but anyway. I do have a fine paintbrush. It's better than using your fingers, actually. Because with your fingers, you can crush them if you're not careful. I'm just gonna take this whole thing and place it in here. And the caterpillars are smart enough to find the fennel themselves and start eating it. We have more babies here. Sorry guys, this is poor lighting. This is in the middle of the night. Oh, look at it, guys. Is it? Oh my god, it's so cute. Hold on. Oh, these are baby butterflies. I am in love. Is this not the cutest thing that you have ever seen? Baby butterflies, guys. They are so small. It's super adorable. Look, they're already crawling around. Let me give, get one close-up of that. Wow, that's incredible, guys. I'm so privileged to be able to do this as my hobby and work. 
So I'm gonna use the paintbrush to scoop them up really carefully and place them here on their new food. Just the fennel. Don't worry, I know how to handle them. It's not hurting them. This is really gentle with the paintbrush. Alright. Come in, little guys. Come on, my little babies. It's the first batch of them, but we have another batch. We are not gonna... I'm not gonna bother to show you the second batch because we already did a close-up. Now this part needs to be real careful. These are dangerous containers, sometimes they pop open violently. So you have to be oof, real careful. Yeah, just gonna take this whole thing to be honest, it's easier. Oh, it's stuck. Well, whatever. There you go. Gonna put these babies in. Come on, little ones, let's go in. Yeah, that's right. That's right, babies. This is the emergency solution. Tomorrow I'll show you what really what we should do. This is just so they start eating tonight. And tomorrow I will I will prepare the real breathing container. Okay, this is just to fill their stomach quickly. Because I don't want them to be hungry all night. Hello everyone and welcome to my butterfly empire. This is where I'm outdoors, raising all my butterflies. They're all native species from my own home country. I like to study butterflies uh, for various purposes. Of course, because I enjoy it, it's entertainment for me. But I also do more than that. I document all their life histories and I write articles about it. Also, I like to document species who are poorly documented. But today this does not apply because we are breeding Papilio Machon, the old world swallowtail. It's not a poorly documented species, it's super common, it's one of the most popular butterflies here in Europe and certainly one of the most common ones, if especially in Central and South Europe. Anyway, let's go! Cut to the chase! So guys, rearing butterflies in a plastic container is terrible. I definitely recommend put the larva on live food plant, yeah? They need living plant, preferably. So I've been growing this in a pot. Oh, it's heavy. This is fennel, funiculum vulgare. One of the favorite foods of the old world swallowtail. <sighs> and today I'm going to make an enclosure for them. Now, the first thing that we need is called a pop-up cage. These are special cages designed for insects. So I'm gonna zip it open. There you go, let's take some of the old stuff out. There's some old leaves in it. Anyway, then I am going to take the pot of fennel that I've been growing in preparation for this project and place it inside of this. Oops, I'm exposing myself. There you go. Place it inside of this cage. Ta da! The idea I'm going to release the caterpillars in here and they're going to forage on the plant outdoors in my garden. They will have native temperatures, native conditions, native weather. So let's get started. Here's the box with the caterpillars of last night. Let's see how they are doing. As you can see, many of them are sitting here on the fennel. Now, this is not going to look very lovely because they are just these tiny black creatures. It doesn't really make for any spectacular video yet, does it? So if you have ADHD and you immediately want to see big, big caterpillars and butterflies, you can skip through the video. But for those of you with patience, watch this. So uh, I'm going to take this piece of fennel. I'm gonna lift it up carefully I'm gonna place it in here yeah I'm gonna put it here inside the fresh fennel and my idea is the caterpillars are going to start wandering around eventually they're gonna start exploring and they're gonna start eating the the, the big the fresh fennel that I'm growing in the pot the idea I'm going to release the caterpillars in here and they are going to forage on the plant outdoors in my garden they will have native temperatures native conditions, native weather. So let's get started. Here's the box with the caterpillars of last night. Let's see how they are doing. 
as you can see many of them are sitting here on the fennel now this is not going to look very lovely because they are just these tiny black creatures it doesn't really make for any spectacular video yet does it so if you have ADHD and you immediately want to see big big caterpillars and butterflies you can skip through the video but for those of you with patience watch this so um, I'm going to take this piece of fennel I'm gonna lift it up carefully I'm gonna place it in here yeah I'm gonna put it here inside the fresh fennel and my idea is the caterpillars are going to start wandering around eventually they're gonna start exploring and they're gonna start eating the the, the big the fresh fennel that I'm growing in the pot They are hard to film because of the wind, but these tiny little things will grow into big butterflies. They are one day old. Wow guys! Great! The butterflies are in their cage, in their enclosure. Now this is the superior method of raising them. Sometimes raising them like this can be super easy. I'm going to keep them outdoors in my garden because it's a native species from my country so they will be able to handle the native temperatures no problem now that doesn't mean I will be automatically successful the most frustrating thing about butterflies and moths is it doesn't matter how much experience you have sometimes things can go wrong and it's not your fault one of the biggest threats here in my garden is ants yeah, sometimes ants like to enter the cages and the, and the plant pots and even build nests in them and the problem is ants they are carnivores and sometimes ants will kill and eat the caterpillars the pupae or even the butterflies so I hope that doesn't happen I hope everything is going to go smoothly I'm going to zip up this cage and from now on I'm going to do a hands-off policy. They're free. I'm, I'm going to check back maybe two or three days later to see how the babies are doing. And then we check back a few days later. All right, folks, it's been a few days. The babies are now, I think, four, four to five days old. It's been really cold. It's been 10 to 12 degrees Celsius. Today, for the first time, we're having a sunny day. So the larvae haven't grown that much because they are cold-blooded and cold-blooded animals need warmth to grow. So I'm hoping and praying for some sunny days. It will make a difference. Let me dismount that little camera. So to show you what's going on here. By the way, here in the back, yeah, this is all, all different species of butterflies that I'm breeding for different videos, but that's okay, that's not for now, just a little teaser. Ah, so if we zoom in, we see these black little thingies. These are our swallowtail butterflies. And as you can see, they're they are alive. That's good. Now guys, if it had been any warmer, if the temperatures would have been any warmer, they could have been in the second life stage already, but they aren't. You're stuck in the first life stage because of the cold. But that's fine, we are not in a rush, right? We have all the time. Uh, it's kind of hard to focus on them with the camera. Filming something so small is always tricky. Can you see them? They say don't count your chickens before they hatched. It's no time to cheer because the project just started. But things are looking really good. Oh, my only complaint is the damn temperatures, it's been too cold. But if we zoom here on the plant, we see a lot of caterpillars. All of them seem to be alive and thriving. It's just that they are so small. It's really a challenge for me to make this entertaining right now. There's not much to see because of their stupidly small size. But yeah, can you see these tiny black things here in the vegetation? These... Yeah. These... Tiny black things if we zoom in. It's 
So these are our baby swallowtails. So that's great, isn't it? I'm really happy with this. Oh, look at that. My little babies. I love you, my babies. Hope you guys will be strong and healthy. And then we check back a few days later. I think these caterpillars can go from caterpillar to butterfly. Well, from caterpillar to pupa. In maybe three to four weeks, if it's properly warm. So I'm hoping Mother Nature, please send us some warmth, please send us some heat. Ah, there it is, it's the sun. This is what we need, we need sunny days. Like, on cold and cloudy days, the caterpillars barely eat. They just sit still, waiting, waiting for it to be warmer. And on warm days, they kind of, hey, they wake up, they start eating and growing. Now, they are a quite a cold resistant species. They have to be because they are, f they are native here in North Europe. This is a very temperate country. So these are native temperatures, but still they prefer warmth. That's just how it is. So, but uh, yeah, things are looking great. Uh, at the moment, I'm really happy. Yep, ladies and gentlemen, I am confident that this is the second life stage in Star 2. Uh, they're already significantly bigger. Really, they are. Let's zoom out a little bit and put my finger next to it. Can you see that? So that's um, significant progress. And if we change and twist the camera a little bit, let's turn it around. Oh, we see many caterpillars here. Can you see it? And it seems that all of them, it's hard to film them because they are kind of hidden in these twigs. But let's have some more zoom. Oh, yes. It's very clear that all of them decided, hey guys, let's go to instar number two which is fantastic if you ask me it is fantastic in my opinion the old world swallowtail is one of the easiest butterflies to breed in captivity uh, most important is that you live in the appropriate climate of course and that you grow a lot of food plant because the caterpillars are going to eat a lot I know it's hard to believe because now they are really small but they are going to be very big and they're going to consume probably the whole plant i need to grow more asap now i know they don't look impressive yet but it's it's starting to come the progress is starting and i can promise you all watching this whole video is going to be worth it it is especially if you're a butterfly lover wow they're so cute now, aren't they? And just to give you an impression of how many we got, let's do a quick... Well, here's one. Here's more of them. See? Two. Okay, come on. Sorry, my parents called me. They come. Four or five. Yeah, there's a lot of them. All right, let's put them back. I think somebody called me. Uh, the point is we have many of them, but they are too small to do a big show. So I'll show it later, yeah? <laughs> Filming the first few in stars always feels a bit awkward. <clears throat> I hope that soon they will be big enough <sighs> to film appropriately. Let's go back indoors and let's hope there will be sunny weather. As soon as the su sun shines, they grow insanely fast. And then we check back a few days later. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it's time to check up on the swallowtails. Let's take them out. There you go. If we look closely here, there's a lot of caterpillars. Let me show you.
the cold spring weather has slowed them down a little. This species can tolerate cold very well. It just means their metabolism slows down because they are a cold-blooded animal. This is a fully grown instar number two. But some of them are already instar number three. Okay, as, as you can see they are doing well, one of them, zoom out, Here's number two, oh this one already shed its skin, I guess we have the first um, Fourth instar now is official, guys. Take a look at this. Hold on, hold on. Wow, that's very pretty. The first instar number four. That's really great, though. Super beautiful. Amazing. And here's more of them, as you can see. They're all over the plant, like literally everywhere. Can you see that? Wow. Look at that. So I think uh, so far it's been a success. And then, of course, we check back a few days later. At this point, we know the drill. Not gonna waste any worms today. Oh, there you go. The amount of caterpillars in here is ridiculous. Let's see, here at my fingertips. Here's one, must be fourth instar, I think. Oh, they're so colorful now. This is insane. Look at it, this is so beautiful. Wow, fantastic. 
but that's not even all of them so let's see here's number two they are very easy to spot now very visible number three number four here we have a number five perhaps this is one of the biggest ones that we've got number five five yeah that's right it's five See, this should be number six. Number seven over here. Hello, number seven. A lot of people consider seven to be a lucky number. Are you lucky? Probably not seven. Let's see, eight. Oh, it's a small one, nine. Oh no, never mind, it's an empty skin, eight. Nine, ten, eleven. What else? 12, 13, 14. So, I count about 14 individuals, but uh, there could be a few more that I haven't noticed or I'm bad at counting. 14? Is that right? There are some ones that are really small, so this is 15. But uh, overall, yeah, this is cool, this is great. Well, well, well. Aren't these growing well? These are almost finished with the third life stage and getting ready to shed their skins and transform into the fourth life stage. Soon the growth will be exponential. Wow guys, so this one seems to be shedding the skin to Instar 5, the final life stage. They are growing really incredible fast. Insanely fast. So soon they are going to be totally fully grown. I can't believe how fast it went. Especially if it's a little bit warm outdoors. I live in a very cold, very temperate country, the Netherlands. Here we have warm summers, but like... I don't know, it's... Maybe a few weeks per year where it's properly warm. And the rest of the time it's just cold. It's some native species to my country though, so they should handle it. They can handle low temperatures, it's no problem. It's just that it takes them a longer time to grow. But since it's been warm lately, they are growing extremely fast. And then we check back a few days later. Are we having a good result? <sighs> of course, of course we are. I've been doing this for a long time. This hobby, I mean. This stuff smells so interesting. It's kind of like licorice. Does that make sense? Mm. I mean, it smells like fennel, but if you want to compare it to something else. Uh, yeah. It's, it's looking great and they will soon be in the final life stage. So I'm... Whew, this is a perfect result, really perfect. Put these dummies back and we're gonna repeat the process all over again. Yeah! Yeah, 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 that's heavy. Oof. This video is a workout for my back. 
carrying this heavy pot all the time, damn. So, uh, let's close it. This is uh, awkward footage. There you go. There you go, babies, babies, my children. That's right, beautiful butterflies. Beautiful little butterflies. Yeah, baby butterflies. Good luck. And then, of course, we check back a few days later. Wow, this is the fourth life stage in Star 4. At this point, they are mean feeding machines. Watch them devour a fennel with incredible speed. In one day they can eat their own body weight in food several times over. These are nature's feeding machines. Look at how insatiable they are. So these caterpillars are absolutely beautiful as you can see. I generally don't recommend handling them because they actually don't really like it and it's not necessary. It's probably the only time in this video that I'm going to handle them. Just to show you some of the ones we are rearing. These are not all of mine, this is just a small amount, small part. I think this is half of the caterpillars I have right now. As you can see they are trying to run away because they are kind of scared. Makes sense. Their color patterns are adorable. Like really beautiful as you can see. Yeah, they are resisting pretty much resisting being handled you can see it's giving them a little bit of stress so it's better if we don't do this every day that being said uh, being a youtuber is my job sometimes I need to make cool close-ups for the video that are entertaining and that kind of show off the features of the insects so enjoy this shot is the only shot of handling we're going to have as you can see they are really pretty super beautiful caterpillars anyway let's put them back they're freaking out this is not the species that likes being touched at all let's put you back let's put you back in the funnel yeah that's right go back to eating go back to eating that's what we want there you go, some of them are climbing back into the host plant where they belong. Oh look, this one just shed its skin. In fact, its old skin is still sitting behind it. You can see how it crawled out of its old skin. Fascinating. Nee, tuurlijk niet. Dat geloven we toch niet? Een fabeltje. Nee hoor, ik heb, kan me nog nooit herinneren dat het buienradar een keer gelijk had. Ik heb niks op de barbecue, ik heb ook geen koude. Huh? We kunnen halen. Ik hoef niet veel te eten, dan eet je maar één ding. Have to guys, have to do a little. What's up? This is Bart Coppens. Oh. So guys, today we have a little update. I'm gonna show you.
First we zip this open. As usual, remove the fennel. It's almost been completely eaten. I'm starting to be concerned. I don't know if I have enough food for all the caterpillars. Anyway, <clears throat> let me show you what I noticed. I noticed that here in the back there's two caterpillars who are assuming a weird position here. Can you see it? They are not interested in the food. They're just kind of sitting here and chilling. How strange. Zoom out, there's another one. This one is just sitting here in the corner, not doing anything, being completely inactive. What's wrong? Well, nothing is wrong. Nothing is wrong, really. I figured it's because they're pupating. These caterpillars are ready to turn into a butterfly. It's good news, because we are really starting to run out of fennel, like... Look at how bald... <sighs> look at how bald this plant looks, like... All the leaves it used to have, are they are gone, like most of it are just... Naked stems at this point, which is not optimal. Um, I'm starting to worry if there's enough food for all the caterpillars. If they start pupating, though, the answer is yes, there is. So the timing couldn't be better. There's a lot of caterpillars on here, let me show you. If you are wondering why I make such long extended shots of the caterpillars, it's because I find them beautiful. And maybe this is the only time I will film the life cycle of this pieces, so I am sure to show them off a lot in this episode. Should you ever wonder what the maximum size is? What's the maximum size these caterpillars attain? Well, this is about it. These are fully grown and the proof is in the pudding because they started pupating. So these are fully grown caterpillars of the swallowtails that we are currently rearing. A fantastic result as you can see they are really healthy, they are, look really strong. Caterpillars are very pretty. There you go. <clears throat> and I think maybe in three weeks, maybe. We'll have the first butterflies, we'll have to see about that. Very nice, isn't it? Just a little showcase of what the plant looks like. Um, that's about it. So the good news is here at the tips. The plant still seems to be growing, there's still young growth. So, leaves. And we zoom down. Here's the most of the swallowtail larvae kind of chilling down here eating really that's what I do so, yeah. they've eaten a lot incredible amounts it's hard to stop them wonderful caterpillars
you are enjoying the show right now, it's a good moment to remind you, my channel is completely demonetized by YouTube. I don't make money from any of my videos, and I am dependent on crowdfunding and donations. If you like my show, consider becoming a member on Patreon. Well, let's hope more individuals are gonna follow their example. The more caterpillars pupate, the more of a relief it is for the plant. So, the less mouths to feed, literally. Hope we don't run out of fennel. Over time, in the comfort of warm sunny days in late spring, the larvae kept feeding. Slowly more and more of them decided to pupate. It's easy to see when they are ready. Their body will be in a curved position and they will spin a silken girdle around their waist. Caterpillars ready to pupate will also aimlessly wander for about a day. They will lose their interest in food and instead they will start looking for the perfect spot to pupate. Right, mm. guys, it's uh, evening, but I just noticed that my caterpillars popped like popcorn and they are wonderful butterfly pupa now, they literally just pupated. Look at these gorgeous swallowtail pupa. I'm not going to harvest them or remove them yet because they are still soft and need to harden. But this is like official, real pupation hours. Guys, these are literally pupating. And that, my friends, is wonderful. Really. This one is still a caterpillar. But the first butterfly pupae are, are a thing. So this is what the pupa looks like of a swallowtail. Great. I'll show you a better close-up later, but it's fantastic. <laughs> Guys, we are getting really close. <laughs> Sorry, I need to learn to behave myself and conduct myself more professionally. We are getting close to getting butterflies. I love this species, I really do. Papilio Mahaong, most beautiful butterfly in my country, probably. At least one of the most beautiful. Give it two weeks, that's how long it takes.
was smart enough to read the rules and lie about his age, so I'll give him that. Hey there, people. So we have a lot of pupa. And I'm going to take some of them out, but not all of them. Why not all of them? Well, some are sitting perfectly on the host plant. And I like to make a video with a natural background with the pupa on the plant of the butterfly enclosing. That would be amazing. But the ones who are sitting on the cage, I can take them off. It's just because that's, that's a specific shot I've always wanted to make. It looks like it's outdoors in nature and the butterfly is in a closing. I could use that for a documentary, for example, in the future. Even though it's filmed in captivity, it looks as if it's happening in the wild. Now, that may sound like deception, but it's not. I'll have you know that when people make nature documentaries, actually, behind the scenes, a lot is filmed in captivity. Just in a way that you don't notice. Anyway. So these pupa here in the corner. Guys, so you want to know something interesting? So the color of the pupa is determined by the surface they pupate on, yeah? So bear with me. So this one here, it pupated on a stem of the plant, right? Let's get a shot of this. My camera is not cooperating. Yeah. So this one is green, right? It's here on the plant. It's green. Right. And if we look here on the plant, we see many green pupa here against the stems of the plant as you can see here this one is sitting against the stem and there's more of them like down here for example here's two of them it's annoying to get some zoom in here guys this is horrible footage really really difficult to show you but see that these ones are green camera cooperate there you go. See that? One green one, two green ones. But actually, not all of them, but most of the ones who are here in the cage are brown. Do you see that? These pupa are brown. So that's funny. So they do, they change color depending on the surface they are sitting on. I thought it was an interesting fact. So yeah, I'm gonna take them off. It's actually quite easy. This is horrible footage, guys. Sorry, I'm filming with one hand as I'm harvesting the pupa. It looks pretty bad, I know. Right, so here's a closer look at some of them. Do you see that? These are the first two pupa I've taken out. It's fantastic. The pupa of this species look like a, a seed. A seed pod. And they are pretty well camouflaged in nature when they're pressed against the stems of house plants. These are gonna be some gorgeous butterflies. I have some younger caterpillars left, but we're gonna ignore those. Because these are actually of a different generation. Had more eggs that came out. But they are not from the eggs from the start of this video. These are younger larvae. Basically some spare eggs. I'm not going to film their development though, we are just going to follow the original ones. So how many pupae are there? Well, so if we zoom here in on the vegetation, you can actually see a lot of them. See that? One, two, three. Like there's a lot of them here. Four. Here's another one, five. Here in the back is number five. Yeah, that's at least five. There's probably a bit more. They're quite even, even in plain sight, they're well hidden. Pretty sure there were way more. So that's five. Oh, I think this is maybe number six right over here. Number six. very cool and then I found five pupae on the walls of the cage see that so that's already ten pupae right now it's 
kind of good, man. It's kind of awesome. I'm happy. So this is at least 10 butterflies already. The pupa of this species are worthy of attention too. They have a dark form and a light form. They tend to be brown or green. But sometimes there's also different shades. The pupa tend to mimic the color of the surface they pupated on. On light surfaces the pupa tend to be green and on dark surfaces they tend to be brown. An interesting adaptation. This butterfly can hibernate in the pupal phase. Sometimes it can take over 8 months for the pupa to hatch and butterflies to come out. And if they decide to spend all winter hibernating, well this video would take a long time. But since I reared these butterflies early in spring, I don't think they will hibernate. Usually they have a second generation. In 3 to 5 weeks we will probably have our first butterflies. people soon oh soon I will have my butterflies awesome gentlemen these are my butterfly and moth cocoons in pupa as you can see I have a lot these butterflies I will incubate some of them indoors here together with the rest of my pupa I will keep them warm and a little bit moist and I think in no time we're gonna see some butterflies, hopefully. That's it. That's all for now. Well, guys, is uh, Bart Coppens, the sexy moth king, going to become the sexy butterfly king now? Truth is, I've always liked both moths and butterflies. It's just that I don't really have the facilities to rear most butterflies. And that discourages me from trying. But I realized there's a lot of native species from my country who have the perfect climate here outdoors, who are very easy to grow on potted food plants. So to answer your question, yes, I'm going to breed more species of butterflies on this channel. It's official. This is the start of something big. Um, but it's going to be European and North American butterflies, maybe Russian butterflies. Still, I'm not going to be able to breed tropical ones because my country is too cold for that. For that I still need to have a butterfly house someday. That would be great. Maybe we'll get there someday. Um, yeah, I'm happy really, this is good stuff. So in here there's, I think there's about six pupa, seven pupa. And about six indoors. So... Usually it takes about two to three weeks for the butterflies to come out, unless it's really cold and it can take longer. They can also hibernate if you're very unlucky, it will, they will wait until next year. But it depends really on the, on, the, on, the, on the climate, on the seasons. So right now it's June. I think June is very early for them to hibernate. If I raise these pieces maybe in August or September, then definitely the pupa are going to hibernate until next spring. But I think these are gonna have another generation. So yeah, I expect to see butterflies in two to three weeks, really. The development of the pupa is quite fast. At one point, the first butterfly came out and I was so excited. This is the best moment in the video when we get the first moth or butterfly. I'm so happy when that happens. Let me show you that day. We have our first butterfly! Guys, ignore these giant freaking moths that I'm breeding. Yeah, they're absolutely beautiful, aren't they? These are African moon moths. But those are for a different video, because today we are actually bringing the old world swallowtail and oh my gosh. The first one has come out and it is so... Gorgeous. It's so beautiful. This is my favorite butterfly. So I'm gonna put it on my finger and for a short moment I'm gonna bring it outside. I'm gonna bring it outdoors to make a close-up. Oh my god, ladies and gentlemen, here it is. The most beautiful butterfly in my country. Papilio 
Machaon, the old world swallowtail. It's so beautiful. I'm gonna stand behind the camera just so I can make a little close up of it sitting here on my hand. Oh my God, look at it people. Oh my God, it is so beautiful. Look at the blue, look at the yellow. And we raced it together on YouTube. My God, it is so beautiful. And it's such a honor to see this incredible species really. It is native to my own country. Wow! And this butterfly right here, it literally was one of the caterpillars that we raised ourselves in this video. We've seen them grow from eggs to amazing butterflies. Like, wow! Don't you agree? They are super beautiful. That's so amazing. Please feast your eyes on this beauty. I'm gonna place it here on this leaf for a second just so that I can make some pictures and close-ups in high definition. Wow, 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 wow. Amazing, I can't believe we actually did it. I can't believe we actually raised this incredible beauty of a butterfly. It's so cool. Just look at its little colors here on the hind wing if we zoom in. Oh, those blue speckles, that blue dusting with the red eye spots, it is so gorgeous. Wow, you just have to love this iconic species, really. Very beautiful, extremely and insanely beautiful. Wow, I love it. Notice how it's threatening us by flashing its wings a little. That's what this species tends to do, they tend to like bluff by flashing their wings open and close. Now guys, here behind me, I have a really big enclosure. Can you see how big it is? It's larger than me. Like I could fit inside of it. And behind the scenes, I've been growing more fennel where the butterflies can lay eggs. First, I'm going to wait until I have several butterflies at once. But something I can already do is I can open this. Now, if guys, if this looks a bit dirty, don't worry. I've cleaned this cage many times, but it's had a lot of history. It's hard to get some of the stains out, but the stains don't really harm the butterflies in any way. And the sun is going to bleach them off eventually. So I will open this cage. And next, what I want to do is, I want to place this, um, yeah, fennel inside. There you go. Perfect. Next I want to do is, I want to wait until I have more butterflies, until I have like two or three. And once I do, I'm going to release them. And effectively, this is going to be like a small butterfly house, really. That's what it's going to be, a small butterfly house. And you know what, I still have the old fennel here that we use to raise the species. As you can see, it's actually growing new leaves on top. And there's still a few caterpillars on it that didn't pupate. I had a few eggs that were basically laid several weeks later. So because of the age difference, caterpillars are still growing. Uh, but also a lot of the pupa of the butterflies are still on here. And I'm gonna place this in inside the new enclosure also. Just like, uh, just like that. Effectively, this is now a small butterfly garden for the old world swallowtail. You can see I still have caterpillars feeding on here, even though the butterfly is already coming out. But these caterpillars were born later. These are basically already another generation. But if we zoom out here on the fennel, you see this is a big cage. They have like a crazy amount of space in here. Here's the new fennel that I've been growing. It's uh, really growing in size. And here's the old fennel. And here on the old fennel, you can still see here some of the pupa. Here's my hand, can you see that? So automatically the butterflies, they're gonna come out here. They're gonna crawl out of these pupa. And when they do, they'll like immediately be living here in their new enclosure. 
as you can see here, some of these cocoons, uh, sorry pupa, not cocoons, I keep confusing them. Some of these pupa are really close to, close to hatching, well how can we tell? Well it's clearly visible because if you look at the pupa you can see, clearly see the wing pattern of the butterfly. It's literally permeating through the pupal shell so these pupa are gonna hatch like, I'll give it maybe one or two days. Some of them are still quite undeveloped but I feel like this is gonna change very soon as well. It's not gonna Which last very look long. At that. It looks like more butterflies have just come out and I'm ready to release them in their new enclosure. In their new cage. As you can see they're absolutely gorgeous, absolutely wonderful. What's there not to love about this magical butterfly species? Oh my gosh. They are so incredible, aren't they? Wow. Alright, so the first thing I'd like to do is, of course, I'm going to release the butterflies in our new home. I showed you yesterday how it was made. There you go. Of course, the zipper is kind of malfunctioning. Oh, there you go. Butterflies. And let's go. Let's go. So guys, I don't know if you can see it, but a few days later I've had a massive birth explosion of uh, swallowtail butterflies. You can see some of them in here. But to be honest, my plan is to go back tonight. When the butterflies are asleep, because that's when they are more cooperative. Uh, these butterflies will actually mate and lay eggs, usually in just a few days, if you take care of them well and they feel comfortable. So I'm hoping that will happen. One thing I've noticed is these butterflies often like to go to sleep on their food plant if they can in the evening this will give us the opportunity for some close-ups like this one for example or this one with its wings closed so the underside of these butterflies is also underrated it's also quite beautiful as you can see it's yellow but they have this beautiful bluish streak and it's also visible on the underside really Such awesome butterflies. If you're ever, in, ever wondering, do butterflies sleep? The answer is a resounding yes. And the proof will be in this video, actually. Let's put this one on my hand gently. Oh, wow, isn't that just gorgeous? Is that not just gorgeous? Yeah. One of the best butterflies in, in my country, the Netherlands. So pretty. really is quite hard not to love them, isn't it? Such lovely butterflies, wow. It's almost as if I made my own mini butterfly garden here.
Now guys, usually I make moth videos. I film the life cycle of many moths on this channel, but it's a little bit more rare for me to make butterfly breeding videos. However, the biggest difference between butterflies and moths is that a lot of species of moths are low maintenance because they don't eat, they don't feed. You can see it in my other breeding videos. But butterflies are very hungry animals. They constantly have to feed. Every day they have to eat, 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 eat. And they have a proboscis, which is almost, it's two fused mouth parts through which they can use to suck up liquids. Now, in captivity you can feed them sugar water, like water mixed with honey or sugar. And there is two ways you can feed them in captivity, the hard way and the easy way. First, I'm going to show you how to feed them the hard way, which is called hand feeding. Let me On show you. Next step, I need some honey. Yeah, and I mix the honey with water. Come on, honey. Let go of my spoon. So yeah, honey water is good food for butterflies. Make sure to stir it so it can dissolve a little bit. There you go. This is a cup with honey water in it. And sometimes these butterflies struggle to feed in captivity, so I like to hand feed them to make sure they are well fed. I unroll their proboscis and put, place it in the honey water and if they like it, they'll start drinking. You can see these ones are drinking. You can see that their proboscis is extended. Those are their mouth parts. And basically they're sucking up the honey water here. That's good. Some extra feeding. It's very warm outdoors, so they need extra nutrients. Very simple. All my butterflies here are in a cage and I take one from the cage and I place it in here on the food. And if they like it, they'll start drinking. And if they sometimes they're confused and they need a little bit of help. Some, sometimes they need to taste the food first, so I'll use a stick to unroll the proboscis of the butterfly. Often they don't immediately recognize it as, as food because they will be confused. So what I do is I use a stick to unroll the proboscis of the butterfly and I place it in the honey water so it can taste it. And if it likes it, it will start drinking. There you go, these are having lunch, essentially. It's important for them. Sometimes they are understandably a little bit confused in captivity and refuse to eat. So this is what I do, they need a little bit of help. Here's my cage of butterflies. I'll just take out one of the butterflies for a minute, which can be difficult, because they don't like to be grabbed. I'm very careful with touching them. As you can see, I know exactly how to handle a butterfly without harming it. So next we focus on the food. So in the wild, these butterflies, they drink from flowers, and this, understandably, does not look like a flower. So sometimes they don't recognize it as food. So I take the butterfly and what I do is let's zoom in on its proboscis. So near its head, it has these mouth parts called a proboscis and you can use a stick to roll it out. Can you see this? Can you see that? Can you see the proboscis that's rolling out right now? And what I do is I make sure to dip it in the sugar water because when it once it tastes it it will start feeding if it's hungry this may take a few tries there you go ah and if it likes it the tongue will be extended and this one is not hungry the hard way to feed them is by hand it starts with mixing water and honey and make sure it dissolves so you have a bunch of honey water.
This is not the recommended way to feed them, but it works. These butterflies are feeding. It's easy to tell if they like it. If their proboscis is extended, they are drinking. Feeding them by hand, however, is a bit stressful because you have to do it manually. Especially on hot days, they need to be fed several times per day. So, of course, an easier method I like to do is... Well, I'll show you that later. If you want to use this feeding method, use about a third or less honey and two-thirds of water. I don't recommend feeding your butterflies this way, however. It's a lot of work and it's very inefficient. It requires you to handle and touch the animals manually and this will stress them out. It's really not that great. Not to mention on a warm day, they need to feed several times per day. So you're gonna have to do the process in the morning, maybe in the afternoon and the evening. Ah, so much effort. But did you know butterflies can feed themselves? That's right. Hey, in the wild they feed themselves. You they don't get somebody helping them. And I just show you the hard way of how to feed them. The easy way is with flowers. Get yourself flowers that they like. Let me show you how to feed them easily. Well guys, the best and most natural way to feed butterflies in captivity is by using flowers. So this is a blooming butterfly bush. It's a budlaya. And I'm going to introduce it to the swallowtails in hopes that they will use this as a nectar source to sustain themselves. I think they will. These butterflies love this plant. Yeah, flowers. It's what they eat in nature, of course. Well, not the flowers themselves, but the nectar. Now keep in mind that not every type of flower will work. You need to do some research. In case you need suggestions, I suggest butterfly bush or badlaya, lilac or seringa vulgaris, or lantana. But in reality, there's thousands of options, but you need to do a little bit of research because butterflies are not attracted to every kind of flower. Make sure the flowers are healthy and in fact flowering, of course, and place them in a sunny place. And it should automatically attract the butterflies to feed. Now guys, what's really cool is the butterflies will feed themselves automatically. So these flowers have definitely served an important purpose. As you can see, they are actually literally coming to the flowers to drink from the nectar. And this is a great way to feed butterflies without any effort involved. I mean, in nature, that's what A few days do. later, I was delighted to find even more butterflies that had come out. Fantastic. Let me show you. They are rare, so beautiful. Another one today. This one seems to be a somewhat smaller individual. Smaller, but not yet less gorgeous now, is it? Wow. Wow. So more and more butterflies are coming out right now. Something that I'm really enjoying at the moment. Every day I wake up and I have some more beautiful, awesome butterflies. They are so beautiful I could almost cry. So beautiful, wow. These two butterflies are surprisingly calm and cooperative right now. It's because they just came out of their pupa. They're still relaxing. But this species is so gorgeous. Just look at how gorgeous they are, man. It's 
in my opinion, one of the world's most beautiful butterflies. Butterflies we've raised. Not even all of them, only a small fraction. And the reason I'm holding them in the middle of the night is because that's when they are asleep. So it's easy for them to sit on my hand and for me to film them. If you are an insect breeder in Europe or the United States, this is absolutely a must breed species. You cannot miss out on this experience, on this wonderful species. They're actually really easy to breed in captivity. All you need is a supply of potted fennel, or you can also use carrots or dill. And you're golden. Butterflies are starting to wake up now from the light and the noise, starting to flutter around. These kind of shots are very hard to make. Yeah, they're starting to fly away. I better put them back. After that, a lot of time went by, several weeks in which not much happened, except the butterflies were feeding themselves from the flowers, but butterflies are usually not in a rush to breed. The moths that I raise on this channel, often they mate and lay eggs in several days. Well, for butterflies, it takes several weeks, but we are patient. Now guys, we are witnessing something rare. My butterflies are mating. Why is it rare? Well, that's because these pieces tend to mate for a very short time. So blink and you will literally miss it. I've raised these pieces several times and I actually almost never see them mating. So it's kind of rare to witness it with your own eyes. All right guys, so these butterflies are mating. This is what it looks like. It looks very clumsy, but basically they are attached together and the male uh, is attached to the female by his abdomen. Sometimes the female will even move around. But yeah, if you see a male and female who are sitting like this, that's how you know absolutely sure that they are making babies. This is what a mating looks like. Butterfly sex, essentially, yeah. It's true. I can't even lie. Okay. So far, so good, eh? Whoa, this is what a pairing looks like. But you have to be very lucky to see it. The butterfly is only mate for a very short time. Usually, it takes about 20 minutes. It's possible to breed these butterflies without ever observing any matings. I was concerned I was not able to catch it on camera, but thankfully I did. What happens next after they have mated, sometimes even before they have mated, but usually after they have mated, is the females are going to lay a lot of eggs. 
Females, suddenly they will be more obsessed with the food plant and if they smell the fennel or other host plants, they will fly around it, trying to lay eggs. And this is what would happen next. If you keep your butterflies alive for a long time, they will mate. Males and females will mate and then the females will proceed to lay eggs. Now in order to lay eggs, they need a live host plant. They will not lay eggs randomly in the cage. Most species of butterflies don't like that. Unlike the moths that I raise on this channel. So the thing about the mating is it's very hard to capture it on camera. I did not manage to film it sadly. But the mating of butterflies lasts very short for like 15 minutes. And that's because they are very vulnerable if they are making love. So the butterfly mating lasts a very short time and it's just hard to capture on camera. But I can show you guys they have started laying eggs. Plenty of them in fact. After mating, the females will be obsessed with the fennel plants and frequently land on them to leave behind yellow pearlescent eggs. If you see a female curve her abdomen like this, touching the plant, you can be sure she is in the process of laying eggs. We look here on the host plant that I just took out of the cage, here's the proof. So this is some fennel I've grown in a pot. And those yellow orbs that are on it are eggs, so basically the females have been laying eggs. Hundreds of them, in fact. Literally hundreds of eggs. Wow. And if these are fertile, I'm gonna literally have hundreds of babies. That's insane, though. Can you see that? Breeding butterflies is not hard, but of course it depends on the species that you want to raise. Important is a lot of space, nectar and potted food plant, as sunlight. There you go. Not bad, eh? Oh, honesty, there's lots of eggs all over. Man, we have so many eggs. There is more fennel in here, like this whole big fennel plant at this point. It's just, yep, all these pale yellow things. Dozens and dozens of eggs that have been laid. Oh man, look at how many eggs. And this whole plant is probably just full of them at this point. So at this point the butterflies started to grow really old. Several weeks went by, but they were feeding themselves well on the flowers. Sunshine.
Eventually all the butterflies started to die. Rest in peace. Now ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, some of the butterflies started to die of old age after several weeks went by. This is normal. Uh, for me, these butterflies, they live three to six weeks most of the time in captivity. And over time, they just deteriorate and grow older. It's quite sad. Let me show you what it looks like if butterflies grow really old and start to die. Now we are almost at the end of the life cycle. Most of the butterflies have died from old age. Some of the oldest ones are still alive, but not very much, sadly. With good care, sometimes they can be over a month old. This is what it looks like if a butterfly starts to die from old age. It's kind of sad, isn't it? But insects don't live very long. We gave them a good life, hopefully. I waited for the butterflies to live out their last days. At one point, all of them died. Rest in peace. And at this point, most of the butterflies have died. They died. They died of old age, but they did leave something behind, so it wasn't all for nothing. The Always, always the boomers in summer, working with their... How? How can I make videos with this nonsense? Oh god. They did leave something behind. Baby caterpillars. That's right, the eggs are hatching and the second generation of butterflies is feeding on the fennel. Let me show you them. This is the second generation of caterpillars. We did it, ladies and gentlemen. Another generation of butterflies. And I can keep breeding them forever. We did it! Life cycle complete. Is the F. This means the end of the breeding part of this video is over. But I always have an educational presentation about the species that we breed in each episode. Let's start the presentation. The point of breeding insects is to learn about them and their life cycles. So this is the educational part, let's go. Today we are talking about a classic and iconic species. The old world swallowtail or Papilio machal. In many regions of the world, this butterfly is a rather famous representative of the swallowtail. In many countries, in fact, it is the only species of native swallowtail butterfly. And taxonomically, it does represent swallowtails, since it is the type species of the genus Papilio. Today we are going to learn a little bit about its biology and ecology. And after all, yes, this is the point of my channel and my life cycle videos, to learn more in depth about wonderful insect species. Here is the global distribution of Papilio Maho. This butterfly has a very large distribution throughout the entire Palearctic region, ranging from Russia to China and Japan, including the Himalayas and Taiwan, and across into Alaska, Canada and the United States. In Asia, it is reported as far south as Saudi Arabia, Oman, the high mountains of Yemen, Lebanon, Iran and Israel. In Southern Asia, it occurs in Pakistan and Kashmir, Northern India, including Sikkim to Assam and Arunachal Pradesh, Nepal, Bhutan and the country of Myanmar especially northern Myanmar. 
this butterfly is widespread in Europe. In the United Kingdom, it is limited to a few areas in the Norfolk Broads of East Anglia. As Papilio Magaon is widespread throughout Eurasia and often common, it is often not considered to be a threatened species. The common name of this species is a little bit silly. It's called the Old World Swallowtail. Now the Old World is a term for Afro-Eurasia that originated in Europe around 1596 after Europeans became aware of the existence of the Americas. This name is silly for multiple reasons. First of all, the butterfly is found in the New World. That by default makes the name incorrect. I feel like this species deserves a much better common name going forward. On top of that, the term Old World never sat right with me either. Some civilizations on the American continent are arguably just as old as those on other continents. Just because Europeans became aware of the existence of the continent later, doesn't mean it's really that new. Something to think about. This butterfly is found in a variety of environments, including tundra, dry grassland, fens, hillsides and open slopes, meadows, arid canyons, river valleys and open woodland. In many places it also seems to thrive in suburbs, although suburbs are not quite the natural habitat. It helps that many of their food plants such as fennel, carrot, parsley and others are vegetables that humans love to eat. So they may benefit from community allotments in suburbs. Very important for this species is the abundance of flowers. This butterfly consumes large quantities of nectar, so it demands flower-rich environments. Interestingly, the latitude seems to affect their habitat. In Northern Europe, for example, the species can be very localized and restricted to fens, bogs and river valleys, while in warmer climates they choose to use other habitats. The species also appreciates warmth and seems to prefer open and sunny habitats over shaded habitats. That's why they can be found in open woodlands but not inside dense forest. The pupa of this species can hibernate and are able to resist very harsh cold and frost. An amazing feat. Since they live in temperate climates, they need to hibernate at one point. When they hibernate is determined by their local environment. In the most northern latitudes, such as Alaska for example, they can have as little as one brood per year. Good to know is that these butterflies have plasticity. It means they can judge the local weather and adapt their life cycle based off that. In warmer years they may decide to produce more generations and in colder years they may decide to hibernate early. The host plants of the Old World Swallowtail fall in two categories. The first category are plants from the carrot, celery or parsley family. This family of plants is named the Apiaceae, formerly known as the Umbelliferae. These are actually well-known and economically important plants, such as ajwan, anise, caraway, carrot, celery, coriander, cumin, dill, fennel, lovage, parsley and parsnip. It should not be a surprise that all the plants I just mentioned are also some of their favorite host plants. The second category are plants from the citrus or rutacea family. Although, interestingly, it is uncommon that they use plants from this family in the wild, they vastly prefer the carrot family over the citrus family. Nonetheless, their ability to feed on plants from the citrus family seems to be an ancestral trait that was preserved. The caterpillars have been spotted feeding on Dictamnus albus or burning bush, but also plants from the genus Citrus, Schimia, Ruta graviolens, Goisia, Xanthoxylium, Philodendrum, and more. 
Strangely enough, in parts of North America the caterpillars have evolved to eat sagebrushes. Or plants from the genus Artemisia, which is old considering it is in neither plant families I mentioned before. I guess this is a rare exception and third category. Let's discuss the behavior of these swallowtails. An interesting fact about this species is that it is a nomadic species. The males are territorial and tend to gather in certain places. Here they defend their territory from other males. Females tend to be more nomadic than the males even, because they constantly wander. Sometimes they ent enter the territories of the males and engage in courtship. The butterflies have a high demand for nectar and a high abundance of flowers in its environment is very important for this species. They cannot survive in environments with not enough flowers. They also need open and sunny spaces. This butterfly really likes sunlight and it avoids shady areas most of the time. The Old World Swallowtail shows an interesting behavior. It is called hilltopping. Hilltopping is the practice of butterflies to gather at certain landmarks. These landmarks can be the summits of mountains or the tops of hills. They are magically drawn to special features in the landscape that stand out. But why? Well, the leading theory is that it helps them find mates. You see, if the density of butterflies is low in a given place, it is difficult to randomly find a mate unless all the individuals decide to gather in similar places. By seeking out the highest points in the landscape on top of hills and mountains, the species encounters other individuals of its own kind. Males are said to have territories on these landmarks. Indeed, in canyons, mountains or on tops of hills in grasslands, males will fight over the best spot and mate with females who pass by. Due to being so widespread, this species has a significant amount of subspecies. Although the status of some of these subspecies is dubious and doubtful, many of them are in fact valid. Let's talk about those. Now unfortunately it is impossible to discuss all the subspecies. The video would be too long if I did that, but I do want to share with you some of the most extreme, unusual and diverse subspecies I could think of. Now of course, what is the most unusual is totally subjective and what I'm about to show you is a little bit cherry picked. Despite this fact, I just want to show you some of that awesome variation they have worldwide. One of the most unusual looking ones is the Papilio Mahon Biardi, known as Bayard's Swallowtail Butterfly. This crazy butterfly has many forms. The polymorphism is extreme. They have forms that look similar to the European swallowtails, but also completely black or intermediate forms. It's probably one of the most varied subspecies. Yes, this remarkable subspecies was definitely worth a mention. Let's look at how much they vary. Yep, this is still the Biardi subspecies. This subspecies appears to be found in California, east to Colorado, New Mexico and Wyoming. Perhaps into northern Chihuahua and Sorona, in the United States of America. Interestingly, they can use tarragon, a species of Artemisia, as their host plant. But they also use desert parsley. I do have to say that as an entomologist, my sixth sense is tingling right now. And I'm pretty sure that this subspecies will be its own valid species in the future, based on the fact their behavior, their host plant and their appearance is different. I'm pretty sure that if someone did a genomic study compared with, uh, combined with morphology, it would reveal that Biardi is actually a different species and perhaps not a subspecies of Mahon. Take notes of this information, people. I wouldn't be the first. It wouldn't be the first time that I've predicted taxonomic changes in my life. I'm calling it. Perhaps one day Papilio Biardi will be its own species. But for now, it is treated as a subspecies of Mahon. Another cool subspecies I would like to showcase is Papilio Mahon Hippocrates. This is a fascinating one with visible differences compared to the European continental swallowtails that I filmed in this video. This subspecies is found in Japan, 
but also in Sakhalin, in the Usuri region in Russia, parts of China and Taiwan, reportedly. And a nice comparison is here. This is the European continental swallowtail, Papilio Mahon Gorganus, compared to Papilio Mahon Hippocrates. You can see the difference between these two subspecies. This picture was made by a breeder that breeds both. The appearance of some subspecies of Mahon can vary enormously as you can see. Interestingly Hippocrates also has a spring form and summer form. The spring form looks closer to the butterflies that I raised in my video today, the ones from the Netherlands. Hmm, interesting. And then the special British subspecies. You Margaret! God bless the Queen! Papilio Mahon Britannicus is a form of Mahon with broad black deep markings with a particularly wide yet black submarginal bands. It occurs in England where Mahon was once widespread but it is now very restricted. This is bad news. This subspecies has lost so much of its range that it's been pushed back to only a very tiny part of the United Kingdom. Nowadays this species is only found in the fens of Norfolk and Cambridgeshire. Sometimes continental swallowtails from Europe migrate to the United Kingdom. Those are the green dots on the map. But these don't really seem to permanently establish themselves. They are temporary visitors. The British subspecies is a resident, however, and is consistently found in the same areas year after year. The green dots on the map are European migrants, but the red dots are the Britannicus subspecies. The British subspecies is also unique because it specializes in using milk parsley as a host plant. While the European Gorganus, for example, can use it as a host plant too, they generally don't like it much. In my country, the Netherlands, for example, they often lay eggs on carrot, wild celery or burnet saxifrage. They will generally avoid using milk parsley in favor of using other plants. However, the British subspecies has a great preference for milk parsley and that's also what makes them unique. It's their primary host plant. This is one of the biggest differences, for example, with continental butterflies. The British subspecies also has different behavior. For example, the British subspecies Britannicus are said not to migrate much at all. Papilio Mahon is an excellent migrant. In fact, all the individuals of the Gorgana subspecies spotted in the United Kingdom are probably migrants that crossed the canal to invade England because they were desperate for an English breakfast, of course. This subspecies rarely migrates. Instead, it is adapted to maintain populations in small areas where it resides for generations. I'm going to quote from a report that I found online. Yes, we are diving deep into entomology today. It was titled Ecology and Conservation of the British Swallowtail Butterfly, Papilio Mahon Britannicus. It talks about the conservation of this insect and I quote A more recent assessment of the butterfly status, combining data from the butterflies for the new millennium recording scheme facilitated by the Biological Record Center since the 1970s and the UK Butterfly Monitoring Scheme since the 1976, goes some way towards explaining these inconsistencies. Fox et al. 2015 described a nuanced picture compromising a significant and welcome 88% increase in total population size over a 40 year period up to 2014. So what this means is the population basically over a 40 year period, the number of individuals increased by 88%. That sounds good. But at the same time, a concerning 56% decline in the occupancy of square kilometer recording squares was also found. So in effect, the butterfly has prospered numerically, but within a much smaller and declining range. So there are some concerns. For example, there is also a new disease that is killing the food plant, milk parsley. At one of its breeding sites last summer, more than 90% of the milk parsley plants wilted and died. 
preventing the plant from setting seed. The distinctive subspecies of the swallowtail seen in Britain would go extinct if milk parsley vanishes. Plant pathologists are urgently seeking to identify the cause of the droop, which has been linked to a fungal pathogen. The new disease threat strengthens the case for the translocation of the swallowtail and the milk parsley to new wetlands further inland, such as large fens that are being restored in Cambridgeshire. The swallowtail cannot fly far enough across inhospitable farmland to reach a new suitable habitat on its own, because this subspecies doesn't really migrate, so specimens would have to be bred and moved across. Another threat could be inbreeding. Due to the British swallowtail being confined to such a small area nowadays, their genetic diversity has decreased a lot. Reportedly, over the past century, the butterflies have shrinked in size, having shorter wings and smaller bodies. It's unclear if this is the result of inbreeding or something else, but it could be. It's clear the future of this unique British subspecies is in danger. If nothing is done to save and conserve them and their habitats. So special attention needs to go out to this subspecies. Now I could go on and on like a broken record. I could show you the small subspecies from Tibet that is adapted to cold and high altitudes and has very short tails on the wings. The tails are almost completely reduced. Or the subspecies in Alaska that is a bit more short and stubby and hairy and has adapted to the climate in Alaska by usually just producing one brood per year, nearly always hibernating in their pupa to compensate for short summers. Anyway, I'm not going to mention every subspecies. I just showed some of the most notable ones to you to illustrate how diverse this species can be across the globe. You see this species presumably has over 41 subspecies and that's the secret behind their success, their ability to adapt almost worldwide in temperate climates, that is, to the local conditions. Well, that is if humans don't destroy the environment, but that's a whole different story. Now of course, since this iconic species and famous species of butterfly, overzealous taxonomists are eager to slap their name on a new subspecies. And it's unclear how many of these subspecies are actually valid subspecies. I could talk about it, but it would take too much time. However, many of these subspecies seem to be valid with substantial evidence that shows huge differences in their ecology and morphology. Truly, this insect has a lot of variations nearly worldwide. To make it even more complex, there is a whole group of similar butterflies worldwide. If you see a butterfly that resembles Papilio Mahon, you could actually be mistaken, depending on what part of the world you live in. In some cases, there are a few species that look extremely similar and are related to the old world swallowtail, but are actually different species. These are found all over the world, from North and Central America to Europe, North Africa and Asia. They do seem to be restricted to temperate climates, however, and are not found in the tropics, as far as I'm aware. The food plants and caterpillars, in many cases, are also quite similar. In terms of conservation, though, there is good news. This species is common, widespread and thriving. It is rated as the least concern on the red list. A least concern species is a species that has been categorized by the International Union for Conservation of Nature as evaluated as not being a focus of species conservation because the species is still plentiful in the wild. Now this sounds like good and happy news. But I also have to, you know, usually when I make these videos, I have to bring bad news to my viewers because so many species right now are at risk of, risk of extinction. But today we are finally studying a common species and it's nice to see that some are still doing well. It is an adaptable species that can migrate very far and has a wide selection of common house plants. That being said, it's important not to generalize, you know, because regionally they can be endangered. Take the British subspecies we discussed before, for example. Some countries and regions can have unique populations and that it is globally common doesn't mean it's common in every country. That's a bit of a generalization, of course. In some countries, they may be more rare than in others. So their conservation should not be generalized, but instead should be judged on a case-by-case -case basis for every country and every population. 
and for every population and every country it faces its own unique challenges. This we have to keep in mind. What can you do to help this species? Well, first of all, it helps to plant the host plants that support the caterpillars, if the species is native to your country, such as carrot or fennel. But butterflies also need flower nectar to sustain them. Plant native flowers in your yard that attract butterflies, it helps massively. Gardens take up a lot of space worldwide. And sadly, our tidy lawns and gardens are often unsuitable for rare insects. To them, it's like a wasteland with nothing to offer, it may as well be desert. Unless you have a variety of native herbs, plants and flowers. Of course, don't use insecticides on your vegetables if you have a vegetable garden. Now, since this butterfly is so widespread, I cannot recommend any native food plants. Because which plants are native to your region will vary a lot. Depending on if you live in America, Europe or Asia. But at least... If you can afford it, you can also consider donating or becoming a member of butterfly conservation groups. I also support sustainable farming, because farmers are often the number one cause of environmental degradation and pollution. Support policies and parties that think about conservation. And lastly, you can support my channel. My channel also needs help. I have the biggest channel about butterflies and moths on the whole internet and I work closely with conservation and other biologists. Let me tell you some more about that right now. So, many weeks after the breeding project, you're probably wondering what happens to the swallowtails. Let me show you. Hope you enjoyed the little presentation. <coughs> so this is where we are at now. As you can see, generation number two is already coming, already already entering the final instar so it won't be very long until these also make pupa huh and if we look further in the vegetation oh my what's this even more caterpillars of the swallowtails yeah you remember them you've already seen them in this video but it's nice to see them again Considering this is probably the only life cycle video I will make about this species for a while now. So, uh, yeah, as you can see, that's, um, they're all doing great. Wow, I love the caterpillars of this species. They're so pretty. Anyway, we have a lot of them. That's good news, eh? And with your help, I can film the life cycle of more species of butterflies in captivity soon. But before that can happen, I need to share some bad news about me and my channel. And now there are some good news and bad news. Let me start first with the good news, because people like good news. Behind the scenes I am working on the life cycle of many butterflies. First is the common blue. Let me show you that cutie. This is the common blue butterfly and I am trying to make a breeding tutorial of this wonderful species. Poliomatis icarus or the common blue is easy to breed. But filming such a tutorial takes a lot of time and effort. Only with your support can we make this happen. So consider supporting my channel and we can rear and show this crazy species and their life cycles. Apart from that, I am trying to breed a beautiful butterfly named the Spotted Fritillary. Let me show you them. I don't know if I have what it takes to breed the Spotted Fritillary butterfly, but I'm certainly trying. I can only pull this off with your help. This amazing European butterfly has a beautiful and awesome checkered underside. It's potentially one of the cutest species in Europe. With your help we could make a breeding tutorial that shows their life cycle and how to breed them. I've also been quite successful at breeding the clouded yellow. Let me show you these beauties. And then there is the peacock butterfly, a very easy to breed species. Let me show you them. The clouded yellow is a very famous pirate butterfly. Breeding it in captivity would not be hard to do. It just takes time, effort and a lot of resources. 
If I put enough thought into this breeding project, I think I have what it takes to pull it off and to show the life cycle of these incredible butterflies. On top of that, I have considered making a breeding video for Aglaes Io, the peacock butterfly. These butterflies are also easy to breed. I could certainly do it if I put my mind to it. In fact, I am already breeding all of these species. It's just that filming the life cycles, editing the video and uploading it are very time and resource consuming. Without the support of my community, I cannot make these kind of videos. My channel is completely demonetized and I don't make any money for my videos beyond what viewers donate to me. Not all the butterflies have to be rare or colorful. I'm also working on some of the most common species because their ecology is interesting. So just the green veined white. Let me show you. The green veined white is not exactly the most colorful or exciting looking species. They're mostly just white. Nonetheless, they are incredibly fascinating and a very good species of beginner butterfly. An easy species for beginners who want to practice how to breed butterflies. I could make a life cycle video if I have your help and your support. Consider this a little teaser trailer. Uh, but behind the scenes, I'm also working on some pretty rare species of moths right now. Want a teaser? Let me show. Even if I say so myself, I am also a talented moth breeder. Behind the scenes I am trying to document the life cycle of many species and I hope that I succeed. Some of these moths are super rare and super hard to breed. But for you I can document all of it and all their life cycles. In return I just need one thing from my viewers to make it happen. You see these videos take ages to film and ages to produce. Being a YouTuber with a small channel and a small business owner is very challenging for me. Financially, sometimes I really don't know how to pull it off. It's amazing that I'm still making videos, honestly. Most people would have quit YouTube years ago, but I keep being persistent. I could film the life cycle of all these awesome species with your help. However, there is one big major issue which may complicate everything. The issue is this, let me show you. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, if you're a fan of my channel, you probably already knew. This channel is not monetized. I don't make any money from my videos. I don't make any money from my content. I've made over one and a half thousand insect videos. I have 33,000 subscribers. But what am I earning from YouTube? Zero. Nothing. But why? Why would YouTube demonetize my channel just like that? Well, I've asked them, I sent them an email and want to know their response? It's this. YouTube does not want to share the rule or guideline that I have violated in order to be demonetized. And I just think that is extremely unfair. It's like punishing your child without telling them what they did wrong. Or like arresting somebody without saying which law they have broken. Of course, being demonetized on YouTube, I don't want to compare it with being arrested. But the metaphor here, it works. It is very painful because I put so much passion, love and attention in my YouTube channel. And YouTube just takes it all away without telling me why. And this makes it very difficult for me to be a YouTuber. I am not on YouTube for money. I am not on YouTube to fill my pocket, to become rich. If I do, if I wanted that, I would become like a banker or a Wall Street stock trader. Not a YouTuber who films moths. But the truth is, I put so much hours, time, effort and resources in my channel. I need to make it sustainable. And here's the big news some of you have been waiting for. But next year, not this year, but next year, I expect to move out of my parents' house. I'm saving a lot of money for my own place to live. I'm getting old. I'm doing it next year, not now, because first I still have another job in Brazil again. I'm gonna go to Brazil for six months if I can get the visa. And of course, I'm not gonna hire a new apartment or a new house for myself. Right before I am leaving for six months, that makes no sense. I would have to pay rent for six months for a place 
where I don't even live. But next year, I hope to find a place of my own. However, this makes the future of this YouTube channel very uncertain. You see, it is very hard to make free time, especially if you have to work and save money for your own adult life, you know. Find a place, you have to pay for groceries and rent. And combine it with making hour-long YouTube videos showing the life cycle of butterflies and moths. I don't even know if I'm gonna have a space to do this hobby. But especially the time and resources is very difficult. So I would like to remind and ask my viewers, if you like this channel, if you like what I do, if what I do, my videos, my personality is valuable to you and you want it to continue in the future, then please consider becoming a patron of my YouTube channel on the crowdfunding platform Patreon or donating to my channel by any other means available in the description under this video. Asking people to donate to me? It's always felt a little bit bad to me. It makes me feel guilty. Truth is, in life we have to make compromises and I have to make a choice between having a financially unsustainable YouTube channel and maybe quitting YouTube and doing something else or doing this annoying cringe internet begging which, to be honest, works. It works. Because it is because of the donations and the contributions of my fans that I am still on YouTube, still making videos, still producing more. Breeding butterflies and moths is a very time-consuming, intensive hobby. And so is filming the whole life cycle of an insect. Every day I need to film the progress, make a little update here and there, make improvements, edit it all together. This is difficult and, dare I say, expensive to do. I am not the kind of YouTuber who wants to emotionally blackmail people and I don't expect everybody to contribute. I am a believer in free and accessible information. I know around the globe there are many people, in, even in developing countries or of low social economic status, who would love to learn about insects. And they cannot afford to do so, because they cannot pay for books, they can't afford to go to school or study biology, or maybe they have to choose a career that makes them more money than looking at butterflies. I understand. There is an economic recession, the housing market is having inflation, it's difficult for young people to make a career and earn money, and I want to say everybody is welcome on my channel, everybody, okay? And of course, not donating or not contributing does not make you less of a viewer, really. Just the fact that you are here watching this, it means something to me. And I don't want to sound like one of those entitled people whining about finances. I don't like it. But at the same time, this message is only for those who are willing and able to help yourself before you help others. But if you like my show, if you like what I do, if you're like, wow, I want to see more, I want to see more species of butterflies and moths, consider making a contribution, because it will ensure the survival of my channel. It will ensure that I can keep making videos. The first way to do is, is Patreon. Let me quickly tell you about Patreon. Patreon is a crowdfunding platform where you can buy a subscription for as little as $1 per month. There are also higher tiers. If you select the higher tiers, they come with higher rewards. Patreon is mainly what sustains my channel. People in higher tiers receive merchandise that I design myself, such as stickers, mugs, posters and more. I recommend it if you are a fan of my channel because it helps me to survive and it helps me to make future videos. Uh, in return, you obtain rewards. That's a win-win. Of course, this message is only for people who are willing and able to afford it. Help yourself before you help others. Hitting certain levels on Patreon also comes with content rewards. If we hit these monetary goals, 
I will make as a reward an episode about Perisomena Kakigena, the Autumn Emperor, and about the moth Saturnia Pavonia. Only if we reach these goals will I make Moth Cycles episode about these awesome species. You can make it happen. This is more motivation for you to help to push the goal higher. As since recently I also discovered a website named Redbubble. And on Redbubble I can upload my own designs of stickers, posters, t-shirts and sell them directly to viewers. If people order them I think I get like 30% of the total sales. It's still filling Redbubble's pockets more than mine, but it helps. And if you would like to see a cool sticker of butterflies and moths that I designed for my own pictures, check this out. Redbubble is a website where I sell designs that have been made personally by me. It contains a lot of items, including a lot of stickers. All the products that you see here are made from photos I took myself. If you order one, I get about a third of the profit. I have uploaded thousands of butterfly and moth stickers that you can order online. It means you will be able to own items with pictures of your favorite species on them. And on top of that, you are supporting my channel. Here are just some examples of some of the stickers, for example, that I developed together with Redbubble. Check it out if you want. That was all for now, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you enjoyed this video of the life cycle of the old world swallowtail. We sure learned a lot today. And I will be back soon with a new life cycle for you. But not before we play the credits, because in the credits we display the names of all my patrons, who are all the people supporting my channel right now. I think it's important to give them credit. So let's play the credits and see you after that.